meeting meeting all of you that I've gotten to meet personally, seeing uh, folks on campus, met today with uh, some students in the psychology group, neurosciences group, met yesterday with folks in the art department. Um, it made me just kind of, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an academic guy, I, I work at Harvard Medical School, but medicine's kind of a trade school, and I have this... Um, maybe rosier than it is, but I don't think so, view of what it's like to be at a small liberal arts college, the sort of life of the mind, and walk around these you know, beautiful buildings and ponder things like life and whether I have to go to the bathroom or stuff like that. <laughs> it's, all, um, it's, it's wonderful, and so I'm, so I'm sort of envious that you guys get to hang out here and i got to get on a plane tomorrow. Um, but um, I'm also very, very grateful to be here. And um, let me just make a quick plug before we launch into this incredibly serious topic, as you can see. Um, <laughs> If you haven't gone to the In Search of exhibit, it's, it's really cool. Um, this, I have all sorts of nostalgic longings for that show because I remember that show, and, and I was able to talk to folks a little bit about it yesterday. It, it was a, an optimistic show during a time of, of, of relative pessimism. It was a well-done show despite its campiness because it was the 70s. Seeing Leonard Nimoy in a kind of groovy suit by itself is worth, worth watching. But also, it, it just made us kind of excited about what could be, and it didn't matter what you were talking about. You could be talking about Bigfoot, you could be talking about aliens, you could be talking about hyper-intelligence. How do we understand those things? And I used to watch that show religiously. So, so when um, Professor Harmon called and said, you know, we got this exhibit, this art exhibit around this TV show in particular, it, it, it was almost like it was a, like a like a screen moment, like this was a screenplay unfolding, and I was going to get to be part of this. So please go, um, go check it out. Go look at that exhibit. There's, the pieces are really cool, precisely because they deal with that that kind of weird feeling you get in the back of your neck when you recognize that what you're looking at could be something more, and you're not sure what it is. You're sort of flying without instruments at that point, and and that's that I think is um, it's an overall benefit of art. The other thing I want to say before we we launch into this is. Um, and we were talking about this last night at dinner. It was a really good dinner, too. Um, you know, there's a movement, not at Rhodes, but at other uh, schools around the country and in, in education in general, to sort of um, make what, what I think is a false distinction. This is sort of a soapboxy moment for me, but a false distinction between the arts and humanities and science. And I think it's silly. I think that's, that is a false distinction. I think one leads, lends to the other. I majored in English and biology. Um, each one had equal importance. I couldn't sort of hierarchically rank one versus the other. And I'm so delighted that um, that sort of spirit persists here. And it's my hope that the trend, which might be going the other direction around the country, can reverse itself and sort of be more like, like all of you. That's you know, my soapbox. Um, and we, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards because I, there's actually some neuroscience that suggests that um, that it's not it, it, that it's study of the arts and the way it relates to science that actually leads to those innovative jumps, that, that sort of capacity to go from A to D as opposed to A to B to C. Um, and, and there are real live neuroscientists in the audience as opposed to me who's a, a clinician, so they, they can talk to you more scientifically about that. But I think intuitively we have a sense of that too, um, that, that we get our innovative moments from, from these moments. And that's actually what this, what this project's about. So, we're going to talk about zombies. Now, um, I am, I am honor-bound by the Hippocratic Oath and by my dean, I'm not sure which one's more important, to tell you that zombies do not exist. I'm, 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 honest to God, I'm required to say that to you. Um, he said, you can go around giving this talk all you want, Steve, but you better tell them they're not real. And I was like, hey, doesn't that kind of like question their intelligence? I mean, like, they, know, they know they're not real, but um, that's what they want me to do. So I'm telling you they're not real yet. Yeah but they're not real. Um, so, so this is your super duper top secret advanced warning about the impending inevitable zombie apocalypse. Okay, so I can make this thing go forward. Put the forward button. Oh, let's go back, sorry. Okay, I gotta do disclosures that's required by my institution and most academic institutions. One is obviously the book. I got paid for writing the book, which was cool. It's cool to get a book contract. Um, the National Academy of Sciences doesn't pay me, but they have this organization called the Science and Entertainment Exchange. It's really cool, where you get calls, I get calls about uh, twice a month from screenwriters who are doing TV or movie stuff, and they say, I want to do this in my story, does it make sense? And so they'll direct the psychiatric stuff, or sometimes the neuroscience stuff to me, and I'll say yes or no, or let's think about it together. They always make me want to sign a disclosure. They're like, please don't tell anybody. Look, there's nobody I could tell that would steal this. Like, Why isn't that exciting? But, <laughs> 
they want you, the neat thing about it is they'll sometimes still do the story wrong. They'll get it wrong, but then they'll do it knowing that they won't do it out of ignorance. Um, and, and this, I, I think it's an incredibly cool endeavor that's made up of an endowment from a, a Hollywood family, um, the Zuckers, actually, who made Airplane, made the movie Airplane, and, um, and the National Academy of Sciences. So I, I mentioned them because they paid for some plane flights for me to go talk. And then the, the book itself, um, this is sort of a fun disclosure, it's been optioned by George Romero, so the guy who made Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and anything of the dead he made, um, as well as some awesome movies, which, which often get overlooked, like Martin and Night Riders. Um, and I'm happy to talk about my, my relationship with George, which actually preceded him optioning it. I called, cold called him when I was writing the book. Um, and he's one of my heroes. I, when I was, as a quick aside, when I was 11 years old, I snuck into Dawn of the Dead. Um, so it came out in 78. Night of the Dead was 1968, Dawn of the Dead, um, 78. I snuck in, told my parents I was going to see The Three Musketeers. Uh, it was a great R, grew up in Kansas City, uh, you know, not far from here. And then was so scared that I called my folks and had to have them come pick me up. Um, and they said, well, why? Did, did you, didn't you see The Three Musketeers? Well, no, no, I saw Dawn of the Dead. I lied and it scared me. I'm really scared you got to come get me. Um, so the, how awesome is it that the guy whose movie I snuck into, now he's helping my book to become a movie. That's like a dream. Um, and it's also a disclosure, so now I've said it. <laughs> I gotta thank some folks um, that are personal. Um, so my wife and two daughters, uh, Naomi's the one with the curly hair, uh, Sophie's the one with the straight hair, and then the dog is, um, that's Corduroy, he's a lab something. Nobody knows what's in him. We also have a, a new one, a little um, mixture of a Dotson and a, it's a dorky, it's a mixture of a Dotson and a Yorkie. <laughs> It really is a dorky. I mean, he, he's, he's awesome. All, everybody in that picture has put up with a lot of nonsense for me as I'm, I'm working on this. And, and um, I'll tell you in a second the impetus for writing this, what has to do with my family a little bit. Um, these are um, some of my mentors and, and just friends who've helped me with it. Jay Fishman's the head of infectious disease for the transplant service at Mass General. He and I spent a lot of time talking about um, what would be a zombie bug. It was funny because at first it's like, Steve, Grady, you're really doing this? And then at midnight he emailed me and he said, you got to go with influenza. I thought a lot about it. So, um, Andy Lichtman is a, is a neuropathologist. We talked about what would um, a brain a brain sections look like. He's an MD, PhD, lab scientist. Um, what was fascinating is I thought people would, would sort of just tell me to get serious, and most docs just wanted to play. I, I think they're just going through the directory and just wanted to play a little bit more, so Andy was, was great. Um, George himself has been a really wonderful mentor to me and learned a lot about film when he he and I became friends, he would send me movies and say, watch this movie and get back to me and tell me what you noticed. And I learned about cinematography and lighting, things I just didn't have any idea about. And then Max Brooks, who wrote The Zombie Survival Guide in World War Z, and he and I have become um, really great friends, and he's been a lot of help, too, in sort of negotiating the, the literary world. And more or less, he's my agent, which is just fun to say, since I've never had an agent. <laughs> okay, so... Um, before we get to this, here's, here's how the book came about, just very quickly, um, and it's not meant to be a tear-jerking story, but it's a true story, it's a story of displacement. My, uh, in 2008, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, she's totally fine now, um, but it was a scary time. My daughters, who are now 12 and 7, were then whatever it is, minus 4, and I can't do the math fast enough. So I was freaking out and um, trying to keep the kids home, keep the family together, and everything's fine now. But I just it was having a hard time sleeping, so I was up late and I was watching whatever happened to be on on demand. And Night of the Living Dead was on. Um, and it, it, as you guys might know, um, it's an eminent domain movie. You can watch it on YouTube. Actually, it's uh, George didn't copyright it. He was a cameraman for Mr. Rogers when he made that movie. Honestly, and um, wanted to make an anti-war movie, an anti-Vietnam War movie. So the zombies were a metaphor for the Vietnam War, which he saw. Maybe naively, who knows? I mean, it was, it, we saw a lot of years to be there, but when he was a young man, he said, why aren't we out of this war yet? So let's create a monster that looks scary, but actually had to be relatively easy to solve. And after all, the zombies can't even open windows, and they can barely walk, and they can't think, and you can eat a sandwich while you're running away from them. So why don't we just put a fence around them and solve the problem, but then let's have the humans screw it up and actually turn on each other. And if you've seen Night of the Living Dead, it's a, it's a devastating movie. Great movie, I mean, I, I love it. And it was on, and I was watching it, not able to sleep, wanting not to think about my wife being sick, and ended up um, thinking, you know what? These stumbling folks, these corpses stumbling around, if I take away the risen from the dead part, because nothing does that in medicine, right? If I take, get rid of that, they're sick. And we wouldn't blow their heads off. We try to find out what's making them sick and make them better. We try to heal them. 
Um, so I wrote a fake medical paper just for kicks, like I didn't have any idea where I was going to send it. And then I got asked to speak about it at a movie theater, and things kind of went from there. So that's, that's how all this craziness came about. Um, so here's now the official talk. I'm going to show you some, some popular culture icons. And this is important to what I said at the very beginning of the talk. What do these icons have in common? We have Vulcans, right? Also the host of Inserto. And we have zombies, as in Fido. That's, uh, if you guys haven't seen Fido, I highly recommend it. What do they have in common? Is yelled out. They're not real, right? They don't exist. Okay, there are no Vulcans. There are no zombies. They don't exist. Nevertheless, any Trekkie dork like me um, knows that Vulcans have a very specific physiology that played actually a major role in the telling of Star Trek. So Vulcans have copper instead of iron as the oxygen binding mineral in their um, hemoglobin. So Vulcans have green blood, like horseshoe crab, for example. Additionally, lesser known subject and only known to the true Trekkies is that the heart of the Vulcan is between the pelvis and the sternum, and it's on the right, which leads Dr. McCoy. Who, I never understood why the boy why there was a family practice. That you like, and there's nothing wrong with family practice, but you think on the most sophisticated spaceship in the history of the world, they would have like a whole slew of doctors, not just like one guy who basically does vaccinations. I never, never sort of understood that. But he says. He's lucky that his heart is where his liver should be or he'd be dead. That's like a famous line among dork, dorky Star Trek folks like myself. <laughs> so, is there physiology of zombies? Well, that's what we're talking about today. That's today's agenda. And lucky for me, it's a really small pond because they don't exist, so I can say what I want. <laughs> but before we do that, let's talk about why we, why we would do this. Why would you, why would I risk What's happened, actually, so I, I should back up and say that never in 10 million years would I say that my patients are zombies. And some folks have thought that's what I'm saying. I'm not. I really want to dissuade folks from thinking that. But why would we then say, why would we use the construct of the zombie as a means to teach uh, functional neurobiology um, to, to uh, any number of audiences? And I think the answer to that has to do with, with this concept of pattern recognition and pattern recognition's kind of um, evil step sister, which is confirmation bias. These things by themselves aren't evil, by the way. They're, they're adaptive. But they can get us into trouble because what happens as we get older is we think we already know what it is we need to know, so then we selectively look for evidence to show that we already know what we need to know. So we're biased in our um, acclimation of knowledge. And part of the theories behind adult teaching are to hit folks in novel ways so that they pay attention. So they say, hey, maybe this is something new. So if you think about a typical medical student, like this one, okay, um, Kumar from Carol and Kumar, and you tell them there's going to be a psychiatrist speaking to you, and the psychiatrist is going to come give a psych lecture. Now, I don't, by the way, I don't talk about zombies to the medical students per se, except in gatherings like this. I don't do it as part of the psych psychiatry curriculum. But if that medical student hears, oh, it's going to be a psychiatrist, he or she inevitably has a certain image in his or his or her head. It's of a you know, kind of a little bit mushy, tweety guy, you know, short, bald, likely Jewish guy. And really, that's, that's, I mean, look at the literature, that's what it says. And what do we give them at Harvard? We give them two. We give them two short, bald Jewish guys. These are the, that's Jonathan Alpert, and that's me, that's 5,000 years of inbreeding, right there. You know, so, um, sorry, hope I'm not saying that. So that's me, obviously, that's John. We're, John is the co-director of medical student education and psychiatry. So we, we end up confirming exactly the patterns they expect to see, right? They think, oh, they're going to come talk to us without emotion, and, and, and it's not hard science, and it's fluff, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so they may not take it seriously. And we want to combat that. We want to make it novel. So I could walk in, and I could be ready to talk to them about the brain, and I could show them this, and say, yeah, that's what I expected him to show me. He's going to show me a brain. Or I could show them this. Right? Um, and that's an illustration from the book. Um, that, that I didn't do the illustrations, by the way. A wonderful um, children's book artist, actually, Andrew Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> you have really traumatized. She would go to the NYU lab and do the, um, watch the dissections. People are going to look, that's exactly the same transection of the brain right there. It's, you can even see, see the same structures, but boy, that's different than that. You're going to look at that. So the hope here was not to say that zombies are real, not to say that my patients are zombies, but to get folks to pay attention to the marvelous thing that is the brain by using the zombie as a construct for that. And I would guess that there's not anybody who thinks about the brain and then watches the slow-moving zombies and doesn't think about brain pathophysiology. So we're aiming for novelty, and the novelty 
is a, is using popular culture, and, and that's that's something I really love. I'm a, there's a reason popular culture is called it's popular, right? So I, I like taking the sort of you know lowbrow in quotes and sort of um, talk using it as a means of talking about other things. I've talked about Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the past. I've written about um, uh, vampires in general. Um, I like horror too, so that's part of the reason. And that's what we're doing here. There are risks though to giving this lecture. So this is a fuzzy copy of the New York Times in 1938 on October 31st when Orson Welles did his famous reading of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Not really, he did, he did camp it up. He changed it, he set it in the present, he added certain landmarks that were specific to New York and to Pennsylvania um, and New Jersey uh, because a meteor had crashed in Princeton, New Jersey the day before. And people panicked. There was mass panic. And, and you can actually, if you go into the um, United States Archives records, you can see the government decisions to try to make this, like, what do we do about this now? And there's actually a movement to have every dramatization from that point forward vetted by the FCC, which had just been created, which would have been horrible, right? Because you don't want, first of all, you don't want them vetting anything to be like Orwellian. But there were risks, right? And I didn't think it would ever be a risk for what I was doing. And it was zombies, for God's sakes. And then things like this started showing up. So this was um, the most recent one. So there were these horrible spates of, um, of really awful events that were unrelated, but they seemed to tie together to the zombie construct this summer, the guy who ate someone's face and guy chopped someone. I mean, awful, horrific events. And the CDC issued an official statement. This is from the, the UK on June 2nd. The CDC issued a statement saying that ataxic neurodegenerative satiety deficiency syndrome does not exist. And that's a disease I just made up. Like, it, it, it doesn't exist because it doesn't exist. It's in the fiction section of the bookstore. And yet the CDC announced it, and as a result, I ended up getting these phone calls, like, how best can we prepare for the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. And, and some people were really mad at me, because when they realized it was, you know, I was messing around, I was telling a story, they said, well, you have an obligation. You're a physician. You can't do this. And I said, oh, it's a zombie. But, but the reason I'm saying this is um, it ain't real. But folks are really willing and ready to believe, especially during times of great uncertainty, and we can come around to that in a second, because that's actually a theme all zombie movies. And we use humor, right? Because during these times of uncertainty, humor is a healthy defense. Shakespeare asked his for asked your forgiveness of him at the end of the Tempest, which was his last play. It's you from crime. I don't have it memorized, I have to read it here. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. That's when Prospero turns to the audience and says, um, you know. Look, if I've offended anybody, I'm sorry. What I'm trying to do is tell a story and make a few profound points along the way. So that, that's my, my hope here. So for today, you're going to pretend, for the purpose of this lecture, that you're medical students and or zombie enthusiasts, and there's a surprising Venn diagram there. Um, there's a big overlap. <laughs> these are the goals. We're going to differentiate these slow and the fast-moving zombies. Um, and boy, if you want to hear people argue, I, I've, been a, I've been lucky enough to speak on panels at the last two Comic-Cons in San Diego. The, the, the yelling about... The, the funny thing is they're all in spandex, so the whole, everybody in the audience is like uh, stormtroopers and they're yelling about fast versions. And, and it's like the DH in baseball, you love them either way. Um, you know, it's like, well, everyone has a strong feeling about it. We're going to talk about the slow moving zombies, and even maybe make an argument that they're scarier. Um, we'll call them SNZs to make it seem more official. Um, then I'll take your questions. Sound good? Word? Okay. So fast zombies. Let's just, if we're going to talk about the slow-moving zombies comparing the fast-moving zombies, we've got to start with the fast-moving zombies. So here's an image from, anybody know what movie? 20 Days Later. Um, actually, the next one's from 20 Days Later. That's a good guess. It's the remake of Dawn of the Dead. And the, the, it's not Sean. It was the 2000, what was it, 4 Dawn of the Dead? Um, and, and they included fast-moving zombies. It was a big change from the original Dawn of the Dead, which is my very favorite zombie movie ever, notwithstanding the fact that I snuck into it. Here's 28 Days Later. But, but they have in common these fast-moving no, zombies. A lot of people will argue that, the, um, that the, the zombies in 28 Days Later are not zombies at all because they're not dead, they're just sick, and they're not trying to eat you, they're just trying to kill you, and there's all these sort of arguments going on. But for the purposes of the trope, more or less, uh, fits. So we need an animal model. If you're going to study anything, you need an animal model. So let's think about what we know about the fast-moving zombies. Well, they move fluidly, okay? They have coordination. That's very different from Romero zombies that kind of stumble about. They seem to have pack behavior. You saw how they were running in a big group there, and they seem to move with intention. So from that, we'll talk about these brain regions later, 
but just to sort of give you an in, uh, sort of introduction to it, we can suggest that their cerebellum's intact, their basal ganglia seems to be functioning, they could swing a baseball bat if they needed to. They have relatively decent depth perception, different from Romero's zombies, which just kind of lunge at you and often miss, just fall. Um, higher, some higher cortical process, enough to hunt, right? And even higher cortical processes because they hunt in packs. We're more like wolves, really. So if you want an animal model, I think this is pretty good. Right? Hyenas, um, wild dogs on the Serengeti chasing a wildebeest. And it's actually amazing how much it looks like that. <laughs> Look at that, it's the same exact angle they <laughs> no, This is what I was thinking about. This. It's, it's amazing how similar it is. That's not the zombies we're talking about. That's a different kind of movie, and I actually find that less scary in a way. Because you don't have any time to think there. You, you gotta run, right? They're gonna chase you, you gotta run. But what if your zombies can't move like that? In the book I wrote, there's another illustration from the book. Those are the four stages of the disease, sort of a reverse evolution picture. And, and, and um, that fourth stage, stage four of ANSD, or ataxic neurodegenerative type deficiency syndrome, that guy's not running ever, right? He's, he's not going to run. So I think that's scarier. If they're just shambling towards you, never stopping, not really caring about you at all, it's completely impersonal. That's actually what's absolutely horrifying about zombies, the lack of personalness to it. It's like the flip side of vampires, right, which are all about you. It's all libidinal. They want you because you're sexy or they make you think you're sexy. That's what people watch True Blood. Whereas <laughs> zombies, I could care. I could step to the right and lead somebody else's guts. And, and, and that's actually more unsettling for humans. We would, you know, if someone could eat my guts, I'd like it to be about me. Like my guts to be special. <laughs> I, I actually really think that's what causes anxiety. And we'll talk about you can use kind of mirror neuron theory to talk about that. So we need a new animal model. And I, I'm going to get in trouble with one of your faculty here because I'm going to use a, a reptile. And you know, we talked about reptiles, and I realize they're a lot more sophisticated than I'm making them out to be here, so I apologize. Um, but we're going to use a crocodile. Okay? We're going to say that a crocodile's not a bad animal model for the Romero-esque zombies, the slow-moving zombies. But there's a problem because an unaltered alligator is really not an accurate model because alligators do that. They can lunge, right? They can move with fluidity when they attack. If you've been to Orlando and already spent your a gazillion dollars at Disney or Hogwarts, wherever, and then you go on to Gatorland, which is totally awesome, and you pay like five bucks, and they make you sign 10,000 waivers, and then you put this really thick glove on, and you hold a, a raw chicken through a hole in the fence, and the gators jump up and eat it like that. It's really fun. It's really cool. Um, no, it's, it's amazing. And, and you see these animals that seem like they're, they're barely able to move, move with unbelievable grace and quickness. So that by itself is not a good animal model for our slow shambling zombies. Our slow shambling zombies can't do that. They don't shamble. These are zombies from Shaun of the Dead. They're not lunging anytime soon, right? So we'll take an alligator. In this case, this was an albino alligator from Gator World, um, whose name, by the way, is Zombie, which is, which is um, Crail for Ghost. And we'll combine it with that, okay? So if you take their cerebellum and their basal ganglia out of the picture, and, and uh, you know, we're having fun here, but we're also learning about the brain. Um, we can say that zombies are like drunk crocodiles. They don't, they don't walk well. That's why a movie that only had zombies in it would be a really boring movie. It would just be people shambling around, right? It's never about the zombies. Zombies are the thing that happens. It's about the humans and how they respond. So tip number one in our way to survive the apocalypse, and this ain't rocket science, is to be more coordinated. You don't, you don't want to drink. If this is, you might feel compelled to drink if this is, but wait till you get into your, you know, safe bunkers, things are locked, and then have yourself a drink, like um, Charlton Tessa does in the Omega Man at the end of every scene. Don't, don't do it now. And when New York Magazine called me last year and said, how should we in Manhattan survive the zombie apocalypse? I said, there won't be one. And they said, we know, just tell us what to do. And so without thinking, I mean, without really thinking about it, the first thing I said was, don't walk while texting. Don't do that. Um, the reason is, She's not paying attention to her surroundings, and if she's about to turn, right, she's toast, right? She's, she's going to turn into a zombie, and she's not going to know it because she's staring at her cell phone. So um, it ain't just don't drink, but be attentive. Zombies aren't attentive. You are. We have higher brains. They don't. We, we should use them to win this thing. Okay. Now let's play doctor a little bit. This is a fake medical uh, record that could come from before my book begins. We'll set it in Dublin, Ireland, a charity hospital. This would be in your medical note. A disheveled middle-aged man with torn clothing, profound confusion, and significant neurological deficits. It's brought to the emergency ward by ambulance at 4.42 a.m. He's placing restraints after the EMT workers know that the patient bit one of them on the ear when they were examining his pupils. 
He will not or cannot respond verbally other than through big basic vocalizations and both soft and hard neurologic signs are globally present. Um, those, those are uh, sort of doctor speak for um, there's something not right with him. We don't exactly know what it is. And we're going to say that, just imagine that we're just starting to see these cases. Okay? Now, if you're, if, by the way, this would not be unusual to see now. But what would the first thing you'd be, think of now? Or, or any substance, yeah. Vassals would be one of them, since that's new on the horizon, but any substance abuse. So the first thing you'd order is a tox screen. And I've presented this to physicians, and they're saying that's, that's um, a PC that's angel dust, will prove it otherwise. Um, and, but there's, all, there's any number of things that could cause this kind of behavior. So one of the challenges to a zombie pandemic would be coming up with um, some kind of triage system that would allow you to kind of bifurcate who's a zombie and who's not, based on judicious use of pattern recognition. So we come back to that top So we're going to play doctor right now. I love this picture from Rex Morgan because he apparently just crashed in a plane, but not an ounce of hair is out of, out of place. <laughs> and, and, and somehow he's going to save her. I don't know, he's going to do it. He's like on a mountain or something. So <laughs> the problem is you guys all have in your mind what a zombie looks like. In the beginning of a zombie outbreak, we would make mistakes, right? We would, because we don't want to miss a zombie, we'd have a lot of false positives. So here's two images from popular culture. Does anybody know what, what this image is from, the woman? Breaking Bad. And then we know what that one's from? Night of the Living Dead. First one. She looks more like a zombie, right? And she's, she's um, Jesse's friend who's, who's addicted to methamphetamine. And, and she's actually a great character, a decent character, all that, not a zombie at all, right? Whereas those look like old people in their pajamas walking around. And those were, those were zombies in the movie. But if you're looking for a particular look, a particular pattern, you're going to mistake the woman for a zombie, and you're going to triage her to a different place, and that would be a mistake, because we need our allies if we're going to fight this pandemic. So tip number two is that you're smarter than the zombies, right? You don't fall for pattern recognition. Don't, don't inadvertently use it, because you can see this guy. Who's that? What does he say, just for fun? You kill my father. You kill my father. Perfect, right. I used to teach high school English, and um, to the ninth graders, I would use those sentences as an example of why you don't want to have a compound sentence. Like if you said, my name is Nick Montoya, and I am your father, or and you killed my father, therefore prepare to die, it just loses its punch. So you want those periods there. So Nick Montoya, as you know, was drunk a lot of the time, and he therefore looked not unlike a drunk crocodile, and if you mistake him for a zombie, you will lose him as an ally, but we know that when he gets sobered up, right, when, when Fenzik, or whatever his name is, keeps dumping his head in the water and finally gets him sobered up, he's that. He's your, he's your best ally. He can protect you. So don't fall for pattern recognition. That's important. And don't do it in general. I mean, that's, that's actually one of the keys to avoiding prejudice. And now we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of the disease that I made up, which we will call for short ANSD, um, because when doctors get anxious about things, they abbreviate it. <laughs> this was um, at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, those are not real zombies. He was a um, he was a software engineer. She's a flight attendant. I can't remember what he did. There was a three thousand person zombie march and um, before the premiere of Survival of the Dead that, that I, George invited me to. It was really fun. Um, so we could also say this is a paradoxical way to have you take me seriously that the brain's really amazing and cool and fun. Although you would all agree with that anyhow because you're all really smart. And why would we do this? Why would we talk about neuroscience now if we're going to talk about zombies? Well, that leads to tip number three. Know your enemy, okay? What's that from, know your enemy? Yeah, the art of war. He said, if you only know yourself and not your enemy, you're not going to do so well. If you only know your enemy and not yourself, you're not going to do so well. you got to know both. But in this case, we're going to know the enemy. In this case, the enemy is not the zombie. The enemy is the cause of the zombie. It's the germ. It's the bug. That's, that's what we're going to create as our enemy. And understanding, knowing anything organic, means understanding how it thinks and behaves all the way down to the level of the molecule and smaller. Okay, So that's, that's the sort of ticket into neuroscience. And because I shrink, I think of things from the neck up. So when I think of a hungry zombie, I don't think of a tapeworm so that's neck down. I'm sort of wondering what would the brain be like of a zombie. And like any good story, there's a cast. Okay, so this, these are the members of our cast, and we'll talk about each of these brain regions in a second. Um, I, one of your professors, uh, with whom I was with earlier today, has a great brain, like a, it, like just sitting there in her office on a, in, you know, in, in, um, it's probably from Alda, I guess, it looks ancient. 
Um, it looks like the one that Marty Feldman brings back in Young Frankenstein. Man. <laughs> um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, that brain in her office. We'll talk about these are the cast of characters: the frontal lobe, uh, creatively named because it sits in the front, so it's right there. Um, the cerebellum back there. The thalamus, it's hard to sort of make out. You can see it down here. Thalamus is Greek for capsule, right there. Um, the um, amygdala we're going to talk about, or I'm sorry, right, hypothalamus right here, creatively named because it sits below the thalamus. And then on the next slide, we'll talk as well a little bit about the basal ganglia and its dopaminergic projections, the limbic apparatus, especially the amygdala, since uh, psychiatrists love the amygdala, and then the anterior cingulate cortex or gyrus, depending on as part of the cingulate gyrus and the anterior part is front, anterior doctor is for front, or and scientees. So let's first talk about the frontal lobe, and folks know a lot of this, so forgive me if I'm, if I'm um, repeating things that you already know and some of you this hopefully will be new for. The frontal lobe is involved with executive functioning, and that's, that's a fancy term for um, being able to sort of manage multiple tasks at the same time. Uh, it's basically think of the job of a busy executive. It's involved with planning, high order processing. It's also very importantly involved in controlling impulsivity. So if somebody, I, I realized by the way this would not happen in the South. Um, in Boston, if somebody cuts you off on the road, road rage ensues right away. You want to hang your middle finger out the window. You want to scream and yell. And your frontal lobe is hopefully the region of the brain that steps on that, basically, and says, not a good idea. This could be your boss. The guy could have a gun. It's just not, not a good idea to piss this person off and just cut you off. Um, and the reason I said this, I'm in the South, is earlier I was in a car and they turned accidentally down the wrong way, and people just very politely said, you're going the wrong way, whereas in Boston they would actually stop just for the pleasure of yelling at you, which is the worst. So let's talk about a very famous frontal lobe lesion. How many people know this lesion? Cool. Okay, so that's Phineas Gage. Um, his skull is actually at the Harvard Library. Um, he, had a, he had a crappy day on September 13th. <laughs> Um, so he, he was a foreman for a um, uh, railroad company up in Cavendish, Vermont, they, where they were laying the tracks in Cavendish. He was packing down the blasting powder with a crowbar. Crowbars were straight back then. Uh, something happened, there was an explosion. The crowbar came up, pierced him through the cheek, and came out through his frontal lobe. He transected his frontal lobe. He lived, not only did he live, he stayed awake. Um, so they led him to the doctor. If you go back and read the records, they led him to the doctor who was on site. The doctor, what else are you going to do? Remove the, the spike. Um, he didn't die of infection. He lived, lived for a long time after that, but he could no longer be a foreman. Um, the foreman's job was to keep the rough, tough railroad workers from fighting and getting to work. You guys have drank enough, go to bed, we've got a lot of work tomorrow. He would get in fights himself all the time. So folks will often celebrate this case as the sort of first example of the frontal lobe's um, control over uh, higher order functioning and decreased impulsivity. It's a little bit of a ruse to celebrate this case in that way because ever since we've been mean to each other, we've been hitting each other in the head. And we know from very ancient records that when people get head injuries, their behavior changes. But this was studied in, in some detail. So he lost the ability for his frontal lobe to talk to another region of his brain. And this is oversimplified. I'm, I'm very anxious because I know there's real neuroscientists here. This is oversimplified here. The amygdala can't talk to the frontal lobe, but the frontal lobe is all messed up, and especially if those tracks get transected by that crowbar. So all that's left then, or, or what's overriding then, is the amygdalar tone, which basically consists of very primitive impulses, the fight or flight, or for the purpose of the zombie talk, a sort of rage, maybe lust, but very primitive lust. We're not talking about twilight lust. We're talking about um, crocodile lust, you know, just the sort of desires. What my neurology professors used to call the crocodile brain. The amygdala is the crocodile brain. You say when you lose your temper, your crocodile brain comes out. And importantly, this is actually sort of a humanities principle, I would guess, the frontal lobe and the amygdala, they have a very balanced, tenuous, and sometimes conflicted relationship. Each relies on the other. If we were all frontal lobe, we'd all be Vulcans, and that would be boring. And if we were all amygdala, we'd all be crocodiles, and that would be boring too. We'd have no poetry in either case, right? So we need sort of both higher and lower brain to create, um, to create period. I was going to say to create art, to create anything. And it's that balance, I'll argue. I have no business saying this, but I will argue that that's what makes us human. But we know that those two parts of the brain fight a lot. They get out of balance. So here is a, um, this, this picture dates me a little bit. What's that from? <coughs> this is the iconic moment when Spike and Buffy finally kiss. It was, it was a big moment, and I've been waiting for this forever on that show. Because, uh, no, I, Buffy was an awesome show, and, and it's a fascinating moment here because Spike's a vampire, and Buffy's the slayer. 
So if there's ever two people who shouldn't be kissing, like if I were Buffy's dad, like this is the guy you don't kiss. This is the guy you slay. Your job is to slay him. But in each case, each of them are thinking with their amygdala, right? They're not thinking with their frontal lobe. So their amygdala is screaming louder than their frontal lobe, and their frontal lobe's ability to dampen that impulse to kiss one another um, is, is decreased at that point. <coughs> Now this happens with adults too, right? Um, and with folks, the more stress you're under, the louder your amygdala screams, and the less chance, we'll talk a little bit about this in a second in terms of those, those tracks, the less chance your frontal lobe has of dampening those impulses. What's, what's he yelling? You lie. You lie, that's right. Regardless of your politics, um, this was a pretty shocking departure from normal um, decorum when the President of the United States speaks. It had never been done before, and that's like since the 1800s that somebody yell, you lie. If we take Representative Wilson at his face, at face value, when, he, when asked why he said this, he said, look, I let my emotions get the best of me. So really kind of what he was saying is that my amygdala was screaming louder than my frontal lobe. I, I tried, but my frontal lobe was unable to catch up with the amygdala impulses at that point. What helps you to do that? What helps the amygdala's tone to decrease? That would be the front part of the anterior cingulate gyrus or cortex. So it's, whoops, sorry. Let's do that. Right there. So this front part, so the amygdala sends signals up to the frontal lobe. It's got to pass through the anterior cingulate cortex. We know from studying things like PTSD that this dampens amygdala tone. Actually, the dorsal, or the um, back part right here, increases, the posterior part increases um, tone from the amygdala. So we know that the connections between primitive and sophisticated have to pass through this intermediate structure, and there are actually genetic differences in people's uh, capacity to use their anterior cingulate gyrus as a means of controlling those impulses from the frontal lobe. I mean, sorry, from the amygdala. And that allows a brief digression into adolescent behavior. Um, just, just for a second, sort of a fascinating question. By the way, almost everybody here is an adolescent by definition, because we don't do it by age, we do it by brain development. And the brain, well, most folks would say the brain development goes on to 26, it goes on through your, your whole life. But when you look at the um, neuroscientific inquiries into development, they'll say 25, 26, 27 is when you've got the sort of increased, um, most density you'll have of neurons in the regions of the brain that we associate with making adult decisions. So that's interesting. That means after that, you start to lose neurons. So most of you have more neurons in your frontal lobe than I have in my frontal lobe, right? And that's supposed to be the region of the brain that's involved with my making complex decisions and controlling my impulsive acts. So why would it be that if I dared potentially somebody in this room, I would never accuse anybody of anything, but if I dared them to drink 10 shots of tequila, they might take me up on it, especially if all their buddies were saying, yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Whereas if somebody dared me to do it, I would say, no, I'm going to go home and watch Lost. I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't need to kill it. And, and literally, why, do, why is that from a neurobiologic standpoint, from a molecular standpoint, given that the neuronal density of anything is greater there? And what we know is that um, it's not about the neurons, it's about how the neurons talk to each other. And adolescence is characterized by increased myelination of certain tracts. Myelin is the, is the insulation that coats the way neurons talk to each other. It's, uh, you can see the myelin sheets in this uh, picture here. Down there, so basically the brain develops in a bottom-up kind of way, so the last tracks to be coded to, to be able to communicate efficiently from lower to higher are those um, limbic frontal tracks. So the louder the, aff the affective noise, the emotional noise, which is like a dare from your buddies, the greater the likelihood of your engaging in something when you're an adolescent because your frontal lobe can't listen to your limbic apparatus. Actually, a lot of um, psychotherapy is slowing down the frontal lobe. I'm sorry, slowing down the amygdala so that the frontal lobe has a chance to play a role in it, to, to have a part. So you don't do something like that. <laughs> Movie? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Very good. And that's his buddy who drives his dad's car through the window um, after he kicks the cinder block down when they're trying to erase the miles but have it go backwards. So that leads us to tip number four. Slow down your thinking. Don't, don't be like a... Uh, uh, adolescent all the time. You don't have to be. Um, so I, I love adolescent, but, but when you talk to um, kids about zombies, you're like, man, it'd be so cool. I just wall myself up, man, and, and I drive fast cars, and I get like tons of guns and shotguns, and I just go out and shoot these things that look human but aren't human anymore. And, and I'm like, when, when you get bored after a while, I'm like, no, no, man, it'd be great, because that's all that happens in the video games. But if you watch the movies, they get a lot more sophisticated than that, and people actually do get bored. So avoid that. Avoid that sort of pull towards the primitive. Moving back to the zombies, they don't ambulate well, 
right? They they have this what's called I'm sorry I don't want to get away from the mic. They have truncal ataxia, so their body goes back and forth. That's why they hold their hands out for balance. It actually mimics almost exactly the description of cerebellar degeneration from the NIH. Um, a wide legged, unsteady, lurching walk, usually accompanied by a back and forth tremor in the trunk of the body. Um, so we can fairly say that I think that the cerebellum and possibly also the basal ganglia of um, zombies are not intact or else they would walk um, more fluidly and more carefully. We've all, by the way, done, well not all of us, but many of us have done things to our cerebellum that hopefully wear off the next day after like a big game or something. So we know that experience, right? But for zombies, it never gets better. So tip number five is to walk fast. Zombies fall over. And this is what's so fascinating about zombie movies. We should be able to solve this, right? Like I said, you need a sandwich while you're running away. So why is it that if a zombie's 200 yards away from you and there's no other zombies around and all you got to do is walk away, why do we turn and shoot them? It's like, why not just walk away? Part of it's knowing that they'll always be there following you. They'll never increase or decrease their speed. That's part of the terror of it. And part of it's, I think, a little bit of a rush from shooting them. Um, and, and that's what you see in those movies. So Romero zombies are hungry. So we think of the brain, um, this is... <laughs> Guess, let's put it this way, guess which mouse had something done to his ventral medial hypothalamus. <laughs> uh, so, so the ventral medial hypothalamus is the region of the brain that's responsible for satiety. It tells you when you've eaten enough, and again, that's something else we ignore, right? On Thanksgiving, you'll ignore it, you'll keep eating. But, but at a certain point, we stop. Um, you can do things to the ventral medial hypothalamus, or there are actually certain viruses that can infect it, the Borna virus, for example, that decrease your ability to know when you're full. Actually, so, so your gut talks to your brain, and your brain says, keep eating, we're still full, we're still full, and you end up like that mouse there. So probably zombies have something wrong with the ventral medial hypothalamus. They're hungry. I like the animation. So you should bring a snack for your zombie, right? Not you, bring a snack, but you may need to heat it, because if they're thinking like reptiles, they might not be willing to bite just anything. So you bring like raw chicken, you may want to heat it up in the microwave, or maybe have those packs that you take when you go skiing that you put in your gloves and surround it thought more about this than I should. <laughs> okay, this question really came up. Um, somebody asked me, uh, how come we never see zombies defecating? And um, it felt unfair to me because, it, like 24, like the whole point of that show, right, was that you never, you watch Fred Bauer 24-7, he's always on camera, he never stops to take a leak. So why do we have to explain how zombies poop? But somebody emailed me this and asked me, and I gave it a, a ton of thought, and the answer is, I really don't know. I have no idea how, how they poop. Um, they might excrete the respiration. If you uh, read the um, book that Guillermo del Toro and Chuck Hogan wrote, um, The Strain, I think, was the first one. Um, they, you could smell the zombies because they would breathe out urea, they would bring out waste products. Um, they do pant and moan a lot, so maybe it's a more mundane explanation. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, if you're just eating human flesh all the time, you're probably not getting a good dose of fiber, so maybe you're constipated. <laughs> the more serious, zombies sense our presence. Sensory input comes through the thalamus. They have limited cortical response, but they see us. So here's the famous Hare Krishna zombie from Dawn of the Dead. Um, and this is a pivotal scene in the movie because that look doesn't look like the look of something that wants to kill you. That's actually what's so wonderful about these movies and so frightening. That look begs to be connected with. And zombies are all about, or the zombie movies are all about the failure to connect with the thing you want to connect with. And we'll come around to that in a little bit. In this scene in the movie, she, he's staring at one of the um, characters in the movie. She's really convinced that this guy's not sick, even though he's blue, you know, and there's something not right. And so she opens the window and he attacks her. Um, not fast, but he attacks her. So they can sense he's looking at her. He's, he's making some kind of sensory contact. So we should hide, right? And the zombies make sense to hide. And there's two ways to hide. You can hide by hiding behind things. Or we have big brains. We don't have to just hide that way. We can hide using mimicry, like they did in Shaun of the Dead, right? So you remember in Shaun of the Dead when they had to walk through the crowd and they just coated themselves in blood and walked like zombies and no one noticed them? It also happens in The Walking Dead, but it's like grosser because they cut themselves in guts and stuff. So to, to sum up before we get to the last part, the zombie brain has just enough frontal lobe activity to listen to the thalamus, to listen to that sensory input, so it can sense us. It, they have uh, cerebellar and basal ganglia dysfunction, so they don't ambulate well. They have all sorts of amygdala noise, so they are hyper-aggressive, especially because they're driven by what? By the fact that they are hungry. They have a dysfunctional anterior cingulate cortex, so they can't dampen whatever amygdala noise there is trying to talk to that frontal lobe that ain't working that well. Their ventral medial hypothalamus doesn't work, which is why they're hyperphagic. They eat all the time and satiate. And maybe, I don't know, 
might be close to So the final tip is know thyself. This above all, to thine own self be true. That's Ian Holm playing who? Polonius, very good. Or if you saw Clueless, do you remember the, um, the great line in Clueless? When um, uh, uh, Paul Rudd's girlfriend is saying, Hamlet said that, and, and uh, the wrong girl who plays, um, you know, the, I can't remember her name, she says, no, it's Polonius, and then the girlfriend says, hey, I think I know my Shakespeare, and she says, I think I know my Mel Gibson. <laughs> so that's the Mel Gibson one. Um, it, it allows us to talk about um, mirror neuron theory, which is really cool stuff, somewhat controversial, kind of cutting-edge neurobiology. Um, the idea here is that you have a, <clears throat> a neurobiologic model for empathy, basically. And so, so just to, um, you can read the slide, but just to give you an example, if I'm um, drinking a beer, and if you want some of that beer, you'll watch me, and if we had electrodes implanted in your brain or we had a functional MRI, you'll recruit regions of your brain that actually taste the beer. So you'll experience the taste of the beer. And you'll have higher regions of the brain that will dampen that experience, because otherwise that's psychosis. You'll be experiencing something that's not there. But, but this was discovered first with primates, later with humans, and it's been seen as, uh, there's been all sorts of very cool studies looking at things like autism or sociopathy, but also as a means of understanding why our brains like to be with other brains, why we like to hang out. Here's an example of one of those studies. Um, mirror neurons and empathic behavior. This was looking at community samples some of whom, through standardized assessments, ruled in for sociopathy, lacking empathy, some of whom didn't. And they found out that different regions of the brain were engaged with this very ingenious uh, experimental design. They told them most of the story that left off the ending. And they wondered how the folks who seemed to lack empathy would tolerate that and what regions of the brain they would, they would involve, in this case, orbital frontal cortex, so they would perseverate, as opposed to what regions of the brain would the non-sociopathic people engage, which would be more reason to have to do with self-awareness and if you think about hearing a story not hearing the ending, it's really maddening. It's, it's kind of the narrative equivalent, you know, musically, like if I went dun, 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 dun. And if, and if you hadn't done that, I would have, right? Because it's, it's painful not to hear that last part. It's, it's something kind of unsettling. We have a sense of a narrative arc going on all the time. So this experimental design of saying, how can we test empathy in the brain? Well, let's give people half of the story and see if they can relate to the characters, not knowing what happens to them. So the humans in zombie movies basically run into this trouble, right? They go on the roof, like in Dawn of the Dead, of the mall, and for a while they're having a grand old time. They start shooting everything that looks human. They've got everything they could possibly need in the mall, right? Remember, zombie, here, let me back up. Here's the construct of the zombie movie. A motley crew of folks who would never in a million years hang out together or shove together. They wouldn't even sit next to each other on the bus. And now they've got to figure out how to get along with each other. And then they wall themselves up in some symbolic structure. So a church, a farmhouse, a shopping mall. These are all things that are loaded with symbolism. And then they've got to figure out how to survive. That's it. That's the whole story. And what makes it interesting is that it should be relatively easy to survive. So they're in the shopping mall, they have everything they could possibly want in Dawn of the Dead. They've got beds to sleep on in the mattress store. They've got coffee, there's even an ice skating rink for them to skate on. They go on the roof every day, shoot a few zombies just for fun, come back down, they sleep with each other, but after a while this kind of ennui sits in. They get bored and they turn on each other. And I think that's because we don't like it when the things we're shooting don't seem to care that we're shooting them. Um, that, that bugs us. So if you're in a fight, and you hit somebody, you'd like to see how you're doing. And if they show absolutely no emotion, it's maddening, and that maddening becomes terrifying. So you're sending out these kind of mirror neuron signals that are ricocheting back at you, and you got nothing to do with them, so you turn on the other humans. So the humans end up fighting with each other with all of that negative energy that was being directed outwards at the zombies, but they're not getting anything back from the zombies because zombies could care less if you shoot them. That doesn't matter to them. So we try to connect with him, right? We want to hug him. But we get that instead. And that's what happens in these zombie movies. I really want him to be human. I really, really, really want him to be human. I'm going to open the door just this one time because I hope he's human. Oh, God, he wasn't human. Every time. The other thing, it's like, shoot her now, man, shoot her now. She's already gone. I can't. It's my girlfriend, my mom, mother. You know, insert loved one there. Um, and so it's all about, like, when they turn, at what point do you define where human ends and something else begins? And those are really profound existential questions which come up in the hospital all the time in much more serious settings and are in some ways easier to ponder you know, in the displacement that a zombie story affords. So we go from this to this, right? And that's a pretty stark change. More importantly, we like it. So this kind of mayhem is fun. 
right? People, if you talk to people, if you listen to folks talk about what would be fun about a zombie pandemic, they'll talk about worlds like this, where the rules are really straightforward. And, and to me, that's, it's interesting because I can understand that, but yet it would be pretty awful. So when I, at Comic-Con, they say, when will the zombie pandemic start? And I'll say, it's not going to start, and then they all boo. And, and Max said, have you guys not seen zombie movies? I mean, this would be terrible. Do you not love your family? This would be a nightmare. Um, but we enjoy this part up to a point. And then we start to lose our humanity a little bit. So that's what I like about the zombie movies. You can outrun them. You can survive for a long time, but you get bored. That kind of ennui sits in. You then start craving connection, but you've forsaken connection with the humans, and you can't connect with the zombies. So you turn on each other. You basically throw in the towel. And it's interesting to see that moment where you give up, where you load up your UPS truck or whatever, drill holes through, put the guns out, drive out into the masses, kill as many zombies as you can, which is dumb because you're never going to win. There's 100,000 zombies out there. So now you're just becoming a zombie. You're just killing indiscriminately. And then usually humans show up, and you realize you're not the humans, last humans left on Earth, and you feel kind of silly and a little bit sheepish and ashamed, as do the viewers, right? Because the viewers of the movie were into it too. I'm like, God, what did I just give up? I just gave up my humanity. So if we want to review our tips on how to survive the zombie apocalypse, then we'll, we'll wrap up. Don't do anything that interferes with your ability to pay attention. Judiciously use pattern recognition. These are basically the same instructions for surviving your freshman year. Um, know your enemy. Know what it is you're up against. Don't act like a teenager. Be agile. Walk fast. Stay in shape. Freshman 15, notwithstanding. Bring an alternative snack for your zombie so you don't worry about it. Hide well. And know yourself. Be mindful of who you are, what your strengths, what your weaknesses are. And then I think we should be able to beat this thing um, if it were ever to happen. That's all I had planned for you. This, um, I'm happy to get emails, phone calls, whatever. But thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. I've got one. Yeah. Uh, first of all, frankly, you creating your own reality to connect theoretical neurology, clinical psychiatry, and psychology, and make it make sense to well, us is incredible. I think it's oh, right. <laughs> can, I, can I fly you to Boston and you can talk to my dean? Because he has a slightly different opinion. <laughs> Scientifically, we know this works if you teach calculus, this works if you teach reading. Uh, but then you have your approach, which is to take all the stuff that we know theoretically, you know, mix it in with some sort of fiction so that it makes sense and sticks. You know, what are the, the benefits and the detriments of using either? It's, it's a great question, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, I mean, I love teaching. But when I look at my, um, not but, but it turns out that when I look at the reviews of my teaching from students, it's almost always bimodal. So on a Likert score, like on a scale of one to four, I'm right in the middle, so I look mediocre. And I might be mediocre, but I think what's happening when you look at it is people either absolutely love it or really hate it. So folks think it's belittling an otherwise serious subject, or you're having a great time um, and learning something, hopefully. If you're just like telling a great story but not teaching anything, then you're not really doing your job. There's an added piece to this, by the way, which is that all of your digital natives' brains are changing, even as we speak, as a function of the technology around us. So we actually have to adapt, not just in terms of popular culture and our teaching, but also in terms of the way we teach, the gamification of teaching, so using video game formats to teach. All of those things, I think, will play a larger role. But my personal experience has been, um, I can't be what I'm not. I love popular culture, so I can't not integrate it in. And it seems to me to be the best way I can get a grasp on making what seem like uh, somewhat arcane topics more available. Some folks like it. Some people really dislike it. And uh, but I can't. I, you know, I don't want to be disingenuous to what I what I like doing. Is it a 50 50 split? You know, I, I haven't done the number probably because I'm afraid to do the numbers. It's um, <laughs> it's not quite 50 50. It's probably like 70 30. Um, I mean, I also I teach at Harvard, which is sometimes a stodgy place, and so some folks get a little worked up over over um, being playful. Um, you know, um, being a child psychiatrist is all about being playful. Kids aren't going to listen to you if you just kind of wag your finger or you say, take this medicine. You have to be playful. First you play, and then you get playful as they get older. And so these ideas come from that kind of attitude. And I think probably for me it preceded being a child psychiatrist. Great question. Yeah. Okay. So in Resident Evil 
two. Oh no, this is like a Comic Con question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they have the Nemesis Project, you know, yeah. they use firearms. Yeah. And, you know, determine enemies. So I was wondering. Can zombies learn? Yeah, it's, you know, um, so it depends what, look, they don't exist, right? So we can make them do it, whatever they want. It, the zombies I created can learn. Their, their frontal lobe would slowly be degraded. I didn't get into the infectious etiology, but it's a recombinantly combined organism that's consists of the influenza virus, um, prions, infectious, you know, the th same thing that causes mad cow and Kreutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, and then a mystery bug, which is kind of in the book, um, embedded in the book. So they can not learn, the ones I talked about. If you watched, um, What's the Romero one with Big Daddy? Um, the the Land big the Land of the Dead, right? He learns, right? He leads the sort of revolution. So different, um, and then in Survival of the Dead, they actually learn to eat non-human things. Mm -hmm. So people play with this trope all they want. To me, the um, what we made, what allows zombies to hold their place as kind of political commentary, the one I like is um, having them not learn, having them be really nothing more than, than like dangerous snails. And then what do you do if there's an epidemic of dangerous snails? Like how, how, and how do we screw that up? What we do? Yeah. Okay. We did discuss the amygdala, the prefrontal, and uh, the frontal lobe in depth, but we didn't discuss the cortex where basically all consciousness sits. So uh, are zombies able to form thoughts and you know, do they have so it's a great question. Um, the reason I'm laughing is, or laughing on the inside, I could laugh on the outside too, because um, I was on a radio show in San Diego, and all they wanted to know was what would a zombie be like if he smoked marijuana. That was the <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, right. There's, and I said, look, they'd be an awful lot like zombies who didn't smoke marijuana. <laughs> yeah, I would have really felt the difference. Um, so in the same vein. Um, even if they did have thoughts, it would be hard to ascertain those thoughts because the mechanisms through which they would get those thoughts out of their mouth um, are, are slowly uh, getting worse. In the story I wrote, um, part, of the, part of the dynamic is that people are getting sicker, and at a certain point they become so sick that they, you can't trust what it is they're saying because they're, as their brain degrades, their dementia progresses. So um, the very scientists who are solving this thing are getting sicker and losing their capacity to solve it. So there's a kind of race against time. And eventually, when you get sick enough, you become stage four. But the UN has, this is kind of geeky, but that the UN has decided is the same thing as being dead. Because I can't raise anything to the dead, so I made them philosophically dead. And then you end up on the table, and the next group of scientists come in to operate on you. So it's this kind of weird, awful cycle where you kind of heroically give yourself up to the disease in order to better understand the disease. Um, so I, my zombies, they don't think much by the time they reach somewhere between stage three and stage four. Um, but stage one and two, they came to and stage one and two, they know they're sick and they're reckoning with that, the fact that they're not going to get better. And you see that in some of the zombie movies as they start to get sick, as they know there's something not right, they try and hide the place where they've been bit and, and you know, not tell people about it. Or kill themselves, right? Or, or, or ask their buddies to kill them, and it seems a kind of mercy thing. Well, being from a neurodynamics background, I know for a fact we can establish intentionality by taking EEG or ECOG measurements. Well, like, so for your stage four zombies, could we like slap an ECOG on them and be like, oh, I don't want to eat my face? Right, it would, it would just be, it'd be nothing. No signals. Um, no signals. Yeah, yeah, they're just, they'll just chomp. All they got are signals of, of lower brain processes, motor movements, the mandibles snapping. Um, I mean, it's fiction, obviously, but it's, but that's, there's actually, a, if, if you get a hold of the, the book I wrote, there's actually a part where they do exactly that. Um, and, and it's kind of this moment like, oh my goodness, there's nothing there. Um, it's like, I mean, zombies always camp. Um, so I don't know what to call it. Um, uh, uh, you. Uh, I was just wondering what part of our brain makes us see patterns? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to defer to the neuroscientists because it's, it's multiple regions sort of talking to each other. The frontal lobe um, in particular will talk. The bridal cortex allows you to understand shapes, sizes, allows you to know if your butt's big enough to fit in a chair or if you can fit through two um, areas on the freeway. Uh, any of the um, folks who are better there? They're all right there. They're sitting together. What would you say? Anything that you would add to that? Oh, how we define pattern recognition, or what region of the brain helps us with pattern recognition? Well, you know, there, there are a number of areas. Uh, you're talking about what, you know, the infratemporal cortex is part of that. So you, the things, what he says, the infratemporal cortex is part of that. 
things to which you attach valence. The reason for pattern recognition is so that you can get through the world safely. That looks enough like a dinosaur. Well, we were not allowed dinosaurs, so let's, unless it's Jurassic Park. That looks enough like a uh, saber tiger that I'm going to avoid it. Even though I can't be sure it's a saber tiger, but I'm going to attach valence to it. Even though I might be wrong, but I'm not going to mess this one up. Yeah? Um, if zombies are indiscriminate and they're attacking... And why don't they eat something other than humans? Or why don't they attack each other? Oh, they, in, in my book, they do. It's just not as satisfying to them. Um, they they um, like their they don't like the way the meat is. It's gross, but they don't like the way the meat is it smells rotting. Um, there's actually a part where the um, in order to keep the zombies in the um, holding facility alive, they have to take off pieces of other zombies to feed them. And it's it's this horrible when they put on Kevlar gloves. And you should see the scene that George wrote for the script. It's really intense. And, and because it's like this moment of like, you know, these are all first do no harm types. And they're doing harm to something that they've been told is not human. But it sure looks human. And it's sure feeling the pain. Um, so in, in my book, the reason they won't do it is mostly because they would rather avoid things that smell rotting and would rather eat things that don't look rotting. Why they don't attack other animals, I, didn't, I sort of avoided that topic. Because um, that, that's part of the magic of the story. You know, right? Not of my story, but of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, kind of going back to the human element of it, you were talking about how a lot of times uh, in these stories and stuff, the humans will eventually turn on each other. Yeah. Uh, could there be the opposite effect? Like, uh, almost like a, kind of like a growing unity among some groups? Well, I hope, it's such a great question. I hope so. I, I, at Comic-Con, no, I really do. I mean, boy, we're, we're such a, a polarized nation right now, and, and in general, the globe seems increasingly polarized. That's why I think zombies are actually a really profound metaphor. I would hope that after a little bit of blowing each other away, we'd say, you know, this is not working for us. All we're getting are less humans. We're not making the zombies any better, and we're not getting ourselves out of this mess. So people would learn to work together. You see that in The Walking Dead, right, where people... Um, who may have had, uh, what's the guy who rides the motorcycle, who was, you know, kind of a back, Daryl, yeah, um, kind of a backwoods guy and, and, you know, was racist in the beginning, sort of drops this stuff. It's, it has no, it never really had a purpose, but it has no purpose in this new world. So folks ask that at Comic-Con, and I, and I always say, um, my, my hope, you know, like, this is why I love Star Trek. Star Trek was a very optimistic show as opposed to the pessimism dystopian. Star Trek, we were going to get it all right, the Earth would be unified. We'd have spaceships, we'd go to other places, and we wouldn't mess with them through the Prime Directive. It was all, like, really happy. And my hope is that if we were faced with something that horrible, we would come together. You know, the viruses don't know national boundaries or political stances, so why should we? And it sounds like John Lennon. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Uh, what is it about, I think, influenza? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's because it's, it's um, first of all, it's always mutating. It mutates really fast. That's why the, there's a new vaccine every year. So, you know, it, it wanders through the southern hemisphere. We take our best guess of what it's going to look like when it hits the northern hemisphere. I just got my flu shot. Um, so, so we have a rapidly mutating bug. It has a relatively long half-life outside of the human body, and it's spread through respiratory droplets. I, I couldn't get this to pandemic proportions when I talked to my epidemiology and ID friends if it was through biting. Right, because if it's even the biting is sort of dramatic and everything, um, if biting is what spreads the bug. We would just put a fence around the biters, and day, you know, day's done, right? Um, but if you can get it through touching a doorknob or touching a keyboard, think it's sort of this level of impending doom. You never know when you're going to come in contact with it. So, and and it turns out that the world's biggest modern pandemics have been have been um, influenza strains. So, talking about Clorox. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, the, um, as I tried to say, SARS is another one, which was a coronavirus, but all of these respiratory viruses that, that spread through droplet transmission. Question? Yeah? So in your book, did you come up with anything that could possibly be an antidote? Yeah, yeah, so it's um, a good question. It's, I, I think I may have hit it too well. Like, like, I put it in the book, but it's hidden, because right as he figures it out, it's a little bit of a spoiler alert, he, he's so sick that he doesn't know he's figured it out. But the reader can figure it out. And I've gotten emails. I didn't think, you know, just it's kind of a gross book, and it swears a little. When the spleen blows up, he uses the F word, which seems like a reasonable thing to say when the spleen blows up. <laughs> I didn't feel, did feel like it was an unjudicious use of obscenities. But he, um, I've had, like, kids, like 8, 9, 10, remember not 8, but 10, 11, 12-year-olds have written to me having figured it out. I'm not going to spoil it for you. And they'll send me articles from, like, JAMA, 
uh, the Journal of the American Medical Service, the Lancet or Journal of ID, they'll send them as PDFs. And then I'll write back and say, bingo, you got it. Or they'll not figure it out and say, you're a little bit closer, check this way. It's really fun. And, and then I'll say, if, you have, um, if you're comfortable giving me your address, I'll send you a zombie action figure, which I always do. And, and there's been a, a lot of people who figured it out. So there is an antidote, and there's a sequel coming that the publishers asked for where it is cured, but then we have new problems. Otherwise, it'd be not much of a story. <laughs> okay. Is, uh, is your zombie virus fatal, or as long as they have food, do they keep just lurching around, or what? Eventually, they die. Yeah, so eventually, this bug would burn itself out. But it's, you know, if you think about the way viruses work, um, Ebola is a horrifying virus, but it's also a not very effective virus because all you have to do, it's horrible, but you just quarantine the area and then it burns out, right? It jumps back into probably primates. So if you, um, you need a bug that keeps the host alive long enough to spread it to multiple hosts. You need an exponential growth that way. But eventually, my zombies, <coughs> sounds so dumb, the zombies I wrote about die. Um, but by that time, a third of humanity is dead. So you got to do something before that happens. You can't let this one burn out. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be here.